<laughs> Infinity is weird. And I think a very uh, meme-worthy and easy way of looking at this is the fact that 0.999 repeating out to infinity is actually, literally, equal to 1. Sounds counterintuitive, right? But think of it this way. Let's do it algebraically. Say I have 10 multiplied by x, some variable, and that that equals uh, 9.999 repeating. Then necessarily, if you bring that down by a factor of 10, then 1x equals 0.9999 repeating. These two expressions are true, so let's subtract them. I have now 9x is equal to, it has to be, 9.000 repeating. Now let's do one more step of math. If we divide both sides by 9, because this is 9.0 repeating, you get x is equal to 1. But 1x also, from this expression that we know, is equal to 0.999 repeating. Infinity is weird. And if you still don't believe me, which I know it is hard to grasp, Think of fractions. 1 divided by 9 is 0.111 repeating. Follow that out. 8 divided by 9 is 0.888. Oh, that's a great 8. Repeating. What is 9 divided by 9? Yes, 0.999 repeating, which we also know is equal to 1. Infinity is weird. Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the part of this channel where I come to you live on Fridays to answer your nerdy questions, try to get things interesting and right off the top of my head, uh, which you can see is in a legolas fashion today. So. Let's get to your questions. Although I will say, I know there will probably, there will probably, probably be, see, it's live, <laughs> a lot of questions about Infinity War, but please do not post any spoilers in the chat. That is not cool, and we will have to ban you. Let's keep it fresh uh, and, and clean, so fresh and so clean clean uh, for everyone who hasn't yet seen the film. Be cool about it. So, Nate, what's our first question? From Matterbeam. Matter beam, no, known and loved by many, <laughs> mostly me. What does he have to say? What type of person do you think is ideal for traveling months in space and colonizing Mars or elsewhere after the first wave of astronauts and engineers have set up the living quarters and workstations? Yeah, so what would be the ideal group of people to first send to Mars? Um, I don't know, this is a very complicated question that I, I I think the easy answer, right, or the answer that most people will come up with would probably be something like you want a scientist and a doctor and an artist and a poet or something like that. Um, and I just, I don't think we've studied the idea enough to know the interpersonal reactions of enough kinds of different people uh, to put them in a pressurized tube for months and send them to some place that they will probably die on. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing the answer to that question, who makes the best first astronauts to the Red Planet, is going to be uh, more complicated and maybe a bit more odd than we think. You wouldn't maybe just want the smartest scientist because maybe he, she, or they wouldn't interact with people very well on a planet. Or, you know, I think it would be fun to go to the Red Planet as, as a first wave, but I'm also very claustrophobic, and I would probably freak out and then Netflix would make a movie about it. So, Matterbeam, I do not know who would make the first uh, best candidates for a trip to the Red Planet, but the cool thing is, is that those candidates are already going through school, and they're gonna be the first on the Red Planet, and they don't even know it yet. How cool is that? I mean, probably, generally, generationally speaking. What's next? Javier Nicolas Bustanti, Korea, asks, would a nuclear explosion underwater be like at the end of the first Pacific Rim. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, 
nuclear explosions underwater, uh, they, nuclear explosions release an immense amount of radiative energy in the form of x-rays and gamma rays and all these things. And it, and it can, it creates a fireball with this interaction of the radiation and the environment. That's why a fireball is created in the air. Um, these x-rays, a sphere, a sphere of x-rays, you know, when a, when a bomb goes off, a sphere of x-rays comes out in all directions and interacts those high energy photons interact with the surrounding environment, heat it up, and it's an instantaneous fireball. The same thing happens underwater. And I've, I've actually read some military studies to say that if, a, if an explosion like this happened underwater, um, there would be an instantaneously created pocket of emptiness vaporized water, which would be, it's like a bubble. It like creates a bubble. So that is kind of close to what happens in Pacific Rim. There would be no water inside of this ex expanding sphere after a, you know, a, a short amount of time, milliseconds probably, um, because all the water will vaporize and it's pushing out. What is cool though about uh, a nuclear explosion underwater is that as this pressure expands into the water, at some point, there will be, as this bubble gets bigger and bigger, at some point the outside pressure of the water will be enough to force this bubble back in to collapse on itself. And when that happens, there will be, it will, it will cross another threshold where the inside pressure is then higher than the outside water pressure. And what all that means is that when a nuclear explosion goes off underwater, there's an oscillating bubble that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's not just like, and then it's done. It's more like, and it's really cool. It's a cavitation bubble, and you can see the same kind of thing happen if you look up uh, firing a gun underwater. Destin from Smarter Every Day, the YouTube channel, has a really, really cool high-speed video of firing an AK-47 underwater, and when you see that, you can see the same thing that would happen in a nuclear explosion. Uh, cavitation bubble that's oscillating and boom, 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 boom creating heat and light and all this cool stuff. Uh, so Pacific Rim has some, as some, some uh, close aspects to the, the real world physics, but uh, Gypsy Danger probably would have been vaporized if it was that close, if I had to guess, which I always have to. What's next? From Joe to Hill, Kyle, would you dye your hair pink? Uh, no. <laughs> would I dye my hair pink? No. Um, no, my, uh, my lady does that already. It, it, it'd be too much pink in our household. Uh, she looks like a unicorn's birthday cake, and I don't need to double up on that. What's next? From Aiden Ray, could Jedi use the Force to fly? <sighs> could Jedi use the Force to fly? Hmm. Depends on how the Force works. <laughs> That's not how it works. I, um... I don't know, the, the, the simplest way I could see a Jedi flying, what a weird thing to say, is controlling the air molecules around a person and using the force to uh, interact with them directly such that the air molecules, oh wait, wait, hmm. I mean, you could create a kind of convective current that is forcing air molecules down away from you in a kind of thrust, which would, then you'd need some kind of Jedi wing. You'd have to fly, <laughs> and, and arms aren't really a great shape uh, for flying. Um, so how could a Jedi fly really? Um, I don't know. With how the force is supposed to work or shown to work, I don't think there's a good way. I don't. I, no, usually you have to lose mass or uh, have something like a flow of air traveling over you. So maybe if, if the Jedi could act like a wing and then forcibly move air past themselves, they would take off. Like how you can just move air past an airplane and even if it's, uh, even if it's not moving relative to the ground, it can still take off vertically. It's pretty cool. All right, what's next? From AJ Frank, would the juggernaut cause nuclear explosions anytime he ran through a material without slowing down? Would the juggernaut create a nuclear explosion if he ran into something? Um, hmm. 
I don't think so. The kinds of speeds, the kinds of particle energies that you would need uh, to uh, create nuclear fusion on a surface are much, much faster than running speed. And in that movie, at least X2, X3, one of them, uh, the juggernaut is jogging. And I, I think what the juggernaut's power is, is unstoppable momentum, not unstoppable velocity or unbound velocity. You'd still have to be going um, very, very, very quickly to induce fusion without uh, increasing pressure or temperature or something like that. Um, so no, I don't think you have a nuclear explosion risk from the juggernaut. What's next? From Jay Markworth, if the Flash was running at top speed and he trips right on this west coast beach, would he just skip on the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> okay. or would his momentum take him out of orbit? If the Flash was running and tripped near the shore, would he skip across like a stone? <laughs> um, I would guess, unless he was extremely lucky, no. Uh, skipping stones, when you find a skipping stone, you want to find something that looks like this. Because when it has some kind of velocity and momentum going forwards, you want the edge of the water to not catch the edge of the stone. Because if that happens, you're going, uh, you encounter suddenly a lot more mass than you were. And that mass acts to uh, impose a force on your momentum, which slows you down very, very quickly. Uh, force is just a change in momentum over time. So if your momentum comes to a stop very, very quickly, it's a high amount of force. Um, and that acts to destroy you. Have you ever tried water skiing and you catch the edge of the water? You go from going whatever, uh, 40 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour to almost dead stop, poof, because you, your edge catches the water, encounters significant resistance, and you stop because water is very heavy. It has, uh, it has a lot of mass to act to stop to slow your mass down. So, um, no, the Flash is probably not gonna skip across a lake anytime soon uh, because humans are not well shaped for this. However, if you think about how people could barefoot ski and they go on their back, maybe the Flash could run at a high velocity and then jump on his back and then skid across. But just tripping, I don't think so. Uh, if any part of his body caught the water at uh, Flash level speeds, it's so much force that it's going to wreck him, break bones, etc. Which is probably why you don't actually want super speed. What's next? From Sputter1471, in Deadpool, we see him be tortured with lack of oxygen. Is there a measure of oxygen where the human body could survive and remain conscious, but feel like we are suffocating? Oh, okay, so is there a level, I'm gonna guess uh, what you mean, a concentration of oxygen inside of some volume that you could be at where you feel like you're dying, but you're still living. Um, your body kind of does that. I don't know what the exact concentration of oxygen in a room is um, to, to stay alive and not die. But your body does this. Your body goes into a euphoric state when there isn't enough oxygen. You're, you're lightheaded. And um, this is why, tangentially, I don't have a true answer to your question, but tangentially, have you ever wondered why uh, when, you, when you're on an airplane that they make such a big deal about putting your own mask on your face if there's a depressurization first. You ever wonder why they tell you to put yours on first? Because at a, at a certain concentration of oxygen inside of the cabin, if there is a depressurization, you will become euphoric and kind of stupid. Your brain is fighting to get enough oxygen and so it's not working correctly and so you get lazy and your muscles aren't working, your muscle coordination goes out the window and you get kind of dumb. And uh, so at a certain concentration of oxygen, you don't really remember how to do this and how to do it well and quickly. So if you don't put your oxygen mask on first, you run the risk of not only dying yourself, 
but not, uh, so you run the risk of uh, not only dying yourself, but not being able to save anyone else because you might be in this state where you're just fumbling about and trying to put a mask on someone else and you can't manage to do so. That's why you have to put yours on first because uh, a dip in the concentration of oxygen in something like an airplane cabin can affect you very heavily and very quickly. Didn't answer your question really, but I think, I think we learned something. What's next? From I feel like I feel colors. Kyle, can you walk you in colors. space? Can you walk in space? Uh, I feel colors. You may have synesthesia, and you might want to get that checked out. Uh, a lot of people with synesthesia reportedly do not know. They go through their entire lives without knowing that they can smell colors or see sounds because they just assume that's how the world is, and they never talk to anyone about it. But if you can feel colors, you might be a synesthete. You should, I don't know, look into it. It's interesting. Anyway, can you walk in space? No. If you were floating in space, not touching anything, just say empty space, if you tried to move, you would stay exactly in the same place. That's because there's no friction, there's no air, there's nothing to push against. And without anything to provide, uh, without anything to put a force on, there can't be an equal and opposite force on you to move you throughout that space. Here on Earth, uh, when you stand on the ground, there is a normal force, and that is your, your mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the planet, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. When you want to walk, there is a drag, uh, frictional force, sorry, that is a fraction, some fraction based on the coefficient of friction, some fraction of that normal force. That frictional force acts to move you forward because there's an equal and opposite reaction from this frictional force according to Newton's third law. Without any of this happening to you in space, you stay put. And you can look up videos of astronauts in the ISS floating and just moving their limbs around as much as they can, but their center of mass stays in the exact same place. So no, you can't walk in space, but you can do a spacewalk. That is because they are tethered to the surface of the space station. What's next? From Hateful Jerk, what would happen if the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy just disappeared? Oh, I'm not smart enough to answer that. What would happen if the black hole at the center of our galaxy went away? Well, it's a, I think it's a supermassive black hole. Um, and I'm not an astrophysicist. But an interesting consequence that I like to think about is that uh, gravity, the information that is gravity, you know, transmitting a force to something across a distance, that only goes at the speed of light. So I, I, I don't off the top of my head know how far it is between where we are on the galactic arm and the center of our galaxy, but I know that if that massive gravitational source popped out of existence, because of how far it is away in terms of light years, it would take hundreds or thousands of years for that information to get here. Meaning that we wouldn't actually feel any change in gravitation for thousands of years. The sun, it takes, about, it takes about eight minutes for a photon from the sun that took thousands of years itself to get out from the core. That's a whole different thing. It takes about eight minutes for a photon of light to get from the sun to the earth at the speed of light, which means that it takes eight minutes for information to travel at its fastest speed, which means that if the sun popped out of existence, the solar system wouldn't feel, well, at least the Earth. The Earth would not feel any difference in gravitational pull for eight minutes if the sun disappeared. Weird. Space is so big that concepts like this start, stop to, uh, start to lose meaning. It, it, it gets weird. That's why I love it. That's why space is so cool. What's next? From Boss King 1312 hmm. Can we make spider webs that we can swing on, like Spider Man? Can we make. Hey! Stop coughing back there. Can we, man, you, you should hear it in here. It's a cacophony of, of void. Um, yes. Uh, so can you make a spider web that you could swing on like Spider-Man? You wanna know something cool? You don't even need to make special spider silk for that to happen. I've calculated this before. I forget the name of the episode. You can uh, look up Spider-Man in my name. But if you have, I think it's about this, 
width that I calculated. The tensile strength, or how much pulling force a uh, how much pulling force spider silk can withstand is in the gigapascals range, I, I think. <laughs> uh, so billions of newtons of force per square meter of cross-sectional area, which means that even at small cross-sectional areas, just the width of this, it can still take a lot of force. I think, I'm pretty sure, this width of spider silk alone could easily support your weight and you could swing on it without it breaking. So I know that spider silk strands are thinner even than that, what I just drew, but if you could collect it up into a strand like a rope, it would only have to be about that thick to support your weight just like Spider-Man. Of course, you'd have to have a legion of spiders in your basement to milk, and it's hard to milk a lot of spiders because they tend to eat each other. <laughs> or so spider milkers tell me. So yeah, you could swing on spider silk right now. Nature is just that cool. What's next? From Truly Evil Bob, mm -hmm. does time control slowing or stopping time have the same drawbacks as super speed or different drawbacks? Hmm. Would stopping time have significant drawbacks? I don't know. I've been asked this question a lot uh, because I've said that I want the superpower to stop time. And there's a lot of weird consequences that I've yet to look into, like could you see? because photons aren't moving. Uh, could you breathe? Uh, that kind of thing. So would stopping time have the same kind of drawbacks? I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there are many. Um, but I haven't looked into that yet. I might soon. We'll see. What's next? From John Butler. John Butler Trio. Which race from Middle Earth would make the best astronauts? Which race from Middle Earth would make the best astronauts? That's so weird. Oh, I know. It's elves. You know why? <laughs> well, if uh, I, I once calculated that Legolas, to walk on the surface of snow without depressing into it, has to, be the, ha has to have the kind of density that something like aerogel has, which is one of the lightest materials by volume uh, that we've ever created. It's like <laughs> uh, aerogel. I do not think I drew that right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> aerogel, uh, a cube of it, can stand on the petals of a rose without bending those petals. Incredibly, incredibly light. And Legolas, an elf, is on the order of that density. I say that because, uh, I say all that because one of the main drivers of cost in getting to space is the amount of mass that you have to get out of the Earth's gravity well. So for his volume, Legolas does not have much mass. He is the volume of a man, but he is the mass of a few kilograms. So you could pack, given you had the volume, a lot more elves into, uh, into a rocket because then, then uh, as compared to something like uh, Aragorn, because they do not have as much mass and you can get more of them into space for the same amount of cost to go work on the red planet in the, on the habitation zones, on the habs, I don't know. But getting, them, getting elves to space would be easy. But would it be more easy than getting a dwarf into space? Does the volume consideration beat out the mass consideration? You nerd snipe me. I'd have to, I'd have to do some math. What's next? From Brad Hayho. Mm. Hey Kyle. Yeah. Regarding the new Venom trailer, would it be possible to use oh, no. goopy tendrils to pull yourself back into an airborne motorcycle? Venom, or John Goo, as we call him here in the office, uh, in the trailer, I don't know why everyone's freaking out about the trailer, but in the trailer, he gets launched from his motorcycle and uses his goo to pull himself back to the motorcycle. And yeah, you could do that. You could goo that. Uh, because because if, if a goo shot out from you and grabbed a motorcycle, it could just supply enough force to pull it back to you. Um, 
and that would apply an equal and opposite force, and you would both be forced to the same point in space, and you could meet each other and get back onto the motorcycle and land. This is kind of what motocross guys do when they do uh, motorcycle moves. No, this is, yeah, 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 this is exact. This has already been done. Motocross guys, they do like Superman seat grabs where they will launch themselves on a motorcycle, let go, and then grab back on and grab and pull and let go again and grab the handlebars. They are providing an equal and opposite force such that their body and the motorcycle go towards each other in the air and they grab and they land. So Venom, that move in Venom is just souped up Supercross. <laughs> Nailed it. Also, call him John Goo whenever you can. It's a lot of fun. I don't know. I don't know. I'm a, re I'm a reporter. You work for bad dudes. What accent is that? What's next? From Heather, 1996. Hey, Heather. What would happen to the Earth if all the weather disasters happened like, all in one day, like in the day before tomorrow? The day after tomorrow? You were close. Uh... <laughs> What would happen if all if every kind of disaster happened at once? I don't know. What is this? Sim City 2000 and you're clicking the button too hard and then UFO show up? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. It would be really bad considering that an earthquake in the right place at the wrong time can wipe out an entire city. So it'd be bad, Heather. 1996? Heather 1996. You've been playing Sim City 2000, haven't you? Stop it. <laughs> The people depend on you. What's next? I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. From Marthinus. Is it possible to dig deep holes and utilize the Earth's core temperature to generate steam and turn turbines? So, could you turn turbine, steam turbines by digging into the Earth and harnessing the heat that's at the center of the Earth? No. At least not viably right now. So, the Earth eh, is... A circle. No, it's an oblate spheroid. And uh, getting down to where it starts to get hot, you don't have to go that far down, relatively speaking, to how uh, the diameter of the Earth. However, because of our technology, we have not been able to go even a few kilometers down. I know drilling rigs go down into the crust of the Earth, but not many kilometers, not enough kilometers such that it gets significantly, significantly hot enough um, that you could turn steam turbines. We just do not have that kind of drilling technology. You would not be able to get close enough uh, to get enough heat to turn those, those turbines. You would have to come up with a real, uh, a much, much better drill baby drill. Let's take one more question, yeah? No, oh, okay, thanks. From Israel in 1948, what would happen to a lightsaber if it went through a Star Trek transporter? <sighs> Why do you do this to me? What would happen if you transported a lightsaber? Oh, no. Uh, um, nothing? That's really hard to say. As far as I know, uh, as far as I know how the technology works, transporters get a an accurate uh, uh, all of the data that they need to catalog every single particle and how that particle is interacting with other particles inside of an object. Uh, catalogs the position, velocity, momentum of all those particles, um, and then takes those particles and sends them to another transporter, and then at that transporter, it is reassembled in that exact same. Uh, pattern, if you will. Um, I don't know why you couldn't do that with something like a lightsaber. It is still material. So if you replaced all of the, the technology and all of the particles in the exact same way, I think you could still get a lightsaber out of it. And then it would hit, it would hit, hit the ground of the transporter room, and then it would break the seal uh, of the ship. And then you'd have to, you'd have to isolate 10 forward. Yeah, see? I've seen Star Trek. Is that all the time we got? Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your nerdy questions. I hope you enjoyed everything that we got up to uh, this week on Because Science. We actually had two episodes. <laughs> 
Man, it all blurs together for me. We actually had two episodes of Because Science go up this week, so go back and check those out. We had an episode about how strong you'd have to be to wield a giant video game sword like in Monster Hunter. Uh, and I used that episode to do kind of like a Mythbuster style version of this show. It turned out really well. I'm really proud of it. Uh, we teamed up with Capcom on it, and I, and I love it. So go check that out if you haven't yet. And then go check out the spoiler-free episode that we did yesterday on how Thanos could throw a moon at the Avengers. It's not a spoiler. It's in the trailers and in press images. Trust me. Um, but what you can expect is more Infinity War science. There are some really cool scenes in that movie and we will get to it. In fact, I filmed one of those episodes this morning. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Next week we have another vlog, another main episode, another live stream. So come back and tell your friends and get these live numbers up because the, the more that you do, the more cool stuff that we can do. So have a great weekend and be nice to each other because this is all we got. <laughs>